This is a short revision video on the balance of payments on the current account designed to go with AQA Economics AS Level Unit 2. It's a really common thing they like to ask questions on, particularly longer answer questions. So as this is quite an important video, or if you don't watch the video, then it's a really important section for you to revise nonetheless. So what makes up the current account? The current account is trading goods plus trading services plus investment income plus transfers. Trading goods is the export of goods, which is tangible things like a mouse, a phone, a phone charger, all the things basically I can see around me. Or you could say they're visible as well because I can see them. Take away the imports of all of these goods. Trading services, the exports of services minus the imports of services. Services is anything intangible or invisible. So education, tourism, then big examples of trading services, financial services in the UK. Incidentally, we've currently got a balance of trade in goods deficit and a balance in trade of services surplus. Investment income. Investment income is basically all of investment income take away all of our investment outgoings from past investments and I'll do this in much more detail like later because this is just quick what's in the current account and later we'll come into detail and talk about them in quite a lot of depth and finally transfers which is official and private transfers of money you do out minus in so the stuff going out which is like payments to the EU that sort of thing mainly government transfers going out and then it's more private transfers coming in so say we've sent someone to work in Russia and they're sending back all their money to their family back here, that's a private transfer into the UK. You may have heard me using the words surplus and deficit earlier and if in case you didn't know what they were, this is that. Surplus is when you have an inflow of money, so the exports from the UK are greater than the imports, so the total value of the stuff we're sending out is greater than the total value of the stuff we're bringing in, which means the money comes into the UK, whereas a deficit is when the opposite is true, so we're importing more than we're exporting, which is basically us at the moment. We've got quite a serious deficit right now. The trade gap is the difference between the imports and the exports. So say we imported a million worth of good and we exported two million worth of good, we would have a trade gap of a million and also a balance of trade surplus of a million. Unfortunately, that's not the case. We've got a quite a serious balance of trade deficit and this is the reasons why. Deindustrialization and globalization are two really main causes. Also, the exchange rate I think we might come on to that later in more detail. Deindustrialization is the fall in the proportion of national output accounted for by manufacturing sector of the economy. So basically, the manufacturing sector of the economy, like the sector that produces goods and services, is shrinking in the amount of output it's producing. And this is mainly due to lower costs elsewhere. So in the UK, we've got quite expensive costs. So raw materials are quite expensive. And also, we have a minimum wage. So there's a certain amount that firms have to pay their workers, whereas in places like India and China, firms just pay their workers very, very little, and raw materials are also much cheaper to them. They've also got no laws on pollution, or they've got laws, but they're not quite the same level as our laws, which are quite strict, which puts up costs even further. Also, countries like that might innovate more, and if they're innovating more than us, their goods and services are of a higher quality, maybe they're more exciting, like the iPhone 5, I don't know where that came from. But that's something quite exciting, whereas the UK, I don't know what we sell, we probably sell a load of rubbish. And then globalisation, which, looking at it now, is the ability to produce and sell goods anywhere in the world. So it's essentially an expansion of world trade. And this is not so good, because previously we just trade with people closer to us. Also, back in the day we traded slaves and stuff, but that's kind of illegal and not really nice. But... Globalisation, now because firms from all over the world can very easily trade goods and services, they've got aeroplanes, internet banking, stuff like that, it means that we've got far more people we have to compete against, and so countries that previously imported goods and services from us can now import them from other countries. So we've lost some of the market for our exports. And to add to this, because we can now buy goods from lots and lots of countries, UK citizens have got quite high incomes, they think, ooh, I'm going to do that. So they buy lots and lots of goods and services from other countries, which means that we're importing more, which is quite bad for our balance of trade, leads to quite a serious deficit. I don't know if you can tell, but my voice is totally going, so I'm sorry if I sound like a frog. Ribbit, ribbit. So how can we decrease the balance of trade deficit? We could increase investment, and if we increase investment into goods and services, we can increase our productivity and this will cause our average costs to fall. So say a firm invested into more capital, this capital means that the worker that's operating the machine can make 
20 boxes an hour rather than 10 boxes an hour, I don't know what they were producing before. So the amount they can produce per this worker per period of time has increased by 10. I suppose that's capital productivity has increased as well. And this means that average costs have fallen because they still have to pay the same amount and they get more out. So lower average costs, which means that we're more price competitive on the international market. So we've got more likelihood of being able to sell our goods and services and thus we'll be able to increase our exports. To add to this, if we increase innovation and enterprise, this also helps to reduce our balance of trade deficit. Because it might lead to us producing more exciting goods and services which sell better on the international market. And if we do more research into what people in the countries want, maybe we'll be able to meet their needs more accurately and better and they'll buy our goods and services. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of different ways to decrease the balance of trade deficit. I think we'll come to a few a bit more later on in this video. But then in later videos, when we finally look at policies and stuff, we'll look at how all of the three different policies are used to try to reduce the balance of trade deficit. So why is it actually important to have a good balance of trade? Well, exports are an injection to the circular flow of income that we talked about a few videos ago. And obviously, if we don't have export selling then we don't get these injections into circular flow so income falls. If income falls and that will lead to a fall in aggregate demand, fall in consumption and stuff and that will lead to a negative multiplier effect which leads to more and more unemployment. Obviously not the best atmosphere for an economy that wants to grow. But if we do have lots of exports and we've got massive injection into the circular flow of income which means that we have a greater national income so the multiplier effect is going to mean that this increase in demand coming from the increased income, people have more disposable income, they'll spend more, increase in good demand because there's an increase in consumption. Increase in good demand obviously has got many, many, many benefits and the multiplier effect will amplify these benefits. The main benefit obviously being employment. Say we didn't have these exports, we would lose our manufacturing industries because they're very dependent on exportation. I mean obviously there is some UK demand for UK produced goods and services, but the majority of the demand comes from abroad and obviously we will lose so so many jobs if we lost this demand from abroad. Now we're going to look at trade and services, services that we export a lot of are financial services, obviously London, the financial centre and tourism. We also import a lot of stuff like sea transport and civil aviation, I think that's how you pronounce it, it's people flying about everywhere. And the, the reason that the UK is so strong in providing services, I and mean, we've got a service, trade service surplus, which is really good, is because we've got a high level of education, so people have the knowledge in their heads to be able to be financial. We get so many people, I mean, economics is almost as popular as medicine nowadays, so many people want to go and study economics, I can understand why, because it's just so fascinating and wonderful. So loads of people want to go study economics, we've got all these people ready to go work in London, the financial like sector. These people bring so much money into the country through selling their financial skills. Obviously, UK systems also have gained a higher human capital from their increased level of training. So many people go to university nowadays to take on apprenticeships and stuff. So these people have greater skills than people in other countries where they don't really have universities and stuff like that. However, an economy that relies on trade and services rather than trade and goods isn't sustainable as it has to rely on other countries for manufactured goods. Because, I mean, the UK does produce quite a lot of manufactured goods itself, but nowhere near enough to sustain the population. I mean... The population demands these goods from abroad, it craves them so much, so, especially because they're cheaper. So in order to have a totally sustainable economy, it would be really good to have a strong trade in services and trade in goods, so preferably surpluses in both. Investment income is earnings made from investments overseas minus income flowing abroad from foreign investment in the UK. For example, if we invested in a French company, a French company made profit, we get money back because we invested in the firm. Maybe we've got shares or something, we get money back. That investment income, investment outcome, I suppose you might want to call it, is when a French firm has invested in our company, we've made profits and we have to give money back to them. That is investment income, the total of it. So how can we generate future investment income? Well, banks could give loans to foreign nationals, so in the future that will generate investment income for the UK. We could also buy up shares in foreign companies. Obviously, if those companies do well, we get money coming back in, that's investment income and setting up new businesses abroad. We're essentially investing in another country's capital and labour and land and stuff like that. And if the business does well, we'll get lots of money coming back in. That is investment income. However, it's important to note that a flow of capital into the UK for any of those reasons will lead to outward capital flows in the future. So, for example, it's great if a German firm comes and sets up here and provides employment for us and stuff like that. 
but it leads to investment income like leaving the country so I don't know what the word is investment outcome I want to call it but essentially it means that money is going to be leaving the future leaving the country in the future which obviously isn't so good could drag us further into a current account deficit transfers come under two categories private and government private transfers tend to be people that are working either in the UK or abroad that come from the other way around so a French person working here he'll send money back to France if he's got a family there that is a like negative transfer it's a bad transfer it's transfer that's money leaving the country Whereas if we have a UK person working in France, sending money back to his family back here or her family back here, that is good. That's a good transfer. Transfer into the country. Woo! And then we have government transfers. Government transfers can come in lots of different forms. But it's all when money is mainly for the government, for the UK, money leaving the country. So grants to overseas countries, UK contributions to the EU budget. Obviously, we have to take the overall... Um, balance there because I mean we do get a bit of money back the EU budget basically all countries pay in and it's distributed differently to how the money's paid in and we always seem to get less back than we give in and it's spent on all like important things and other things of course as well and that's one of the main reasons why there's this debate about whether the UK should leave the EU or not then we have contributions to international organisations you know that's when there's disasters and stuff like that and we give money to help the poor uh, no, not the poor, the dead. No, they, they don't need help. Uh, the injured. The injured. Mm, the survivors. The, those people. Maintenance of troops abroad. Obviously, we have to look after troops. And then maintenance of embassies and consulates. A government transfer is essentially anything the government pays that goes to another country or a government from abroad pays that comes into our country. Now we have our reasons for the change in the current account. Exchange rates. A strong exchange rate is bad. It means that exports are expensive to people abroad and imports seem really cheap to us so we import loads and our exports don't really sell well on the international market. That leads to an increased deficit. Income. If the national income rises, woohoo, more demand, more aggregate demand. Sounds amazing except we spend it all on imports because imports are cheaper than UK produced goods and services in general. Deeper deficit. Inflation. When our inflation is greater than trading partners, our exports seem really expensive because obviously we've got a higher inflation than them. So they don't buy our stuff because they may as well buy their stuff from countries that have lower prices. And all their goods seem really cheap to us because they haven't got inflation and we've got inflation, meaning our prices are going up and up and up. So we just get all of their imports and we take them and we buy them. Deeper deficit. Productivity. Finally a surplus one. If we have an increase in labour productivity, that leads to lower average costs, therefore lower prices. More competitive UK, woohoo! And that means it's a balance payment surplus, woo! And then innovation. Innovation obviously coming up with new ideas, get new products, lots of new products, maybe some new designs for capital. That will increase our productivity. And also if we've got new products, we can be more competitive on the international market because people think, ooh, that's quite a nice idea, I'm going to buy that. So... People choose our products because they're more innovative and stuff like that. And that will lead to a surplus because we'll be able to export more. We're now going to demonstrate the effects of a current account surplus and deficit on the AD slash AS model. So if we have a current account surplus, it means we're probably exporting more and importing less. We know that exports are like a positive component for aggregate demand. So if we increase our exports, that increases aggregate demand. And a decrease in imports is also good because imports are like a negative component of aggregate demand. So if we are decreasing the amount that we're importing in, we are increasing aggregate demand further. So as you can see on the model, not the model, the diagram down there. So on the left, I wanted to put it underneath all the green stuff, but it didn't really fit without shrinking so small that you couldn't read it at all. You could barely see it. Anyway, yeah, so we're shifting aggregate demand, it's increasing, so we're going to shift it right. That will lead to a slight increase in price from AD1 to AD2 and a massive increase in real output, which is obviously really good. Then we have a further increase in exports and a decrease in imports, so an even greater surplus. This leads to AD rising all the way to AD3. I mean, this is a positive output gap and it's, it could look good, but if you look at it, we've got all this inflation here. On the left, the price level has rise dramatically, but there's no massive increase in real output, so it's basically really inflationary, not so good. On the right, 
we can see the effect of a current account deficit on an aggregate demand and aggregate supply. If we have a decrease in exports and an increase in imports, leading to the current account deficit, that shifts AD to the left because AD is falling, because obviously exports, if they're falling, that reduces AD, and imports are rising, that reduces AD further. So we've got a reduction in AD from AD to AD2, which is a decrease in price and real output. So I mean, on the one hand, we're getting like less inflation, then on the other hand, output has just dropped, which is really bad because it leaves people losing their job. Because if we're not producing so much output, we're not making so much, we don't need to employ as many people to make stuff. So people become unemployed, negative multiplier effect, total tragedy. The current account equilibrium. Ooh. This occurs when the current account has absolutely no effect on the domestic economy. So it doesn't matter how much we're importing or exporting, this has absolutely no effect on the economy back home. So basically, I mean, in general, it means that it's balanced, so imports are equal to exports, stuff like that. And this leads to a much greater level of stability in the economy. There's quite a big argument about whether the current account is actually important or not. Some people say the deficit isn't actually that important because a lot of the stuff we are importing is actually capital goods and then raw materials that we're going to use to increase our output in the future or capital equipment that's increasing productivity in the future, leading to you know, lower average costs, more competitive in the international market. If we're importing raw materials, it leads to a rise in output, so the deficit's going to fall further and further. So that's going to be really good in the future. So short term, yes, we have a slight deficit, but in the future, we're going to have a shrinking deficit and maybe even a surplus. Obviously, the deficit's only going to fall if we actually export the goods and services we produce. If we just have them domestically, that's not going to have any impact on the current account, we'll still be in our deficit. The second argument here, um, I'm not too keen on it, to be honest. I mean, the deficit basically says that the deficit due to consumer demand is self-correcting, so the economic cycle means that demand will fluctuate, so it will sometimes be greater and sometimes it will be lower. So, say that demand is high at the moment, in, in the future, demand will you know, shrink because of the economic cycle that we did in the first video, I think. And that means that in the future we're going to import less. But we're in a really severe deficit at the moment and demand is pretty low for imports. I mean, obviously it's high, but we're in a recession. People don't actually have that much money. So I'm not too keen on the second one just to the current time period. Maybe if we were in a positive output gap and stuff and everyone was demanding loads at the moment and I thought maybe in the future it was going to fall or reduction in demand for imports but we're in you know not a good place we haven't got that much demand because national income isn't that high so that's you know one reason i'm not keen on the second point but you know if you're writing an essay you could put both sides down you know argue you know this is what some people believe but then dot 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 you know explain why you don't think it's correct but you might think it's correct and you might believe in this completely so in which case ignore everything i've just said then finally the uk has actually attracted inward investment so it can finance its current account deficit. Maybe, alas, on the other hand, there are a lot of issues with the deficit. A major one, which you should always put down in essays, how much I hate circular flow of income. This point is great when you're talking about current account deficit. It sounds like you know what you're on about. It's withdrawals from the circular flow of income, because if people are spending on exports, that's money they're not spending on UK goods and services, money leaving the country. So it's a serious withdrawal from the UK um, circular flow of income. And eventually that will lead to reduced output because firms won't get so much back in from the consumer. So they'll, you know, have less money to spend. They'll maybe have a reduced output, especially if people are demanding imports rather than UK goods and services. So firms can have reduced output and that leads to reduced employment, obviously serious unemployment, negative multiplier effect, not so good. Finally, it means, you know, there's an increased loss of competitiveness. So maybe it's because we've got low productivity, Maybe we've got a loss of comparative advantage. Maybe they've got absolute advantage in other countries. So they've been able to specialise loads and we simply can't compete with that. Maybe we haven't invested enough into our production or our labour force or stuff like that. So if we can't export stuff, we're losing international competitiveness. That's not good. And finally, obviously, unemployment due to industry. I mean, it should say decline. I don't know where decline's gone. But industry decline. If we've lost our industry, you know, it's basically deindustrialization. They've basically stolen our industry. If they can produce manufactured goods and services cheaper abroad, we can't compete with that. Those industries are going to shut down. 
That means that the people that used to work there are now occupationally and geographically immobile. They're stuck in places with the skills for manufacturing, but no demand for, you know, UK many produced manufactured goods and services because they're so much cheaper overseas where they've got no minimum wage these people you know they've got the right skills for manufacturing but not the right skills for accountancy or finance or whatever's taking off at the moment in the uk so they're stuck also they tend to be in one place so they're geographically immobile as well not really very good Woo! that is the end of the current account section which means the next time we get to move on to the policies which is obviously very exciting Hope you've recapped what you knew in this video and you feel more prepared for the exam or something or whatever. Just have a lovely day and best of luck in the exam. Bye!